Nikki Haley and Donald Trump wrapping up their attacks against each other as the next primary in Nevada is next Tuesday. But as the delegate count poses challenges for Nikki Haley, will she make it past South Carolina? Does she still have a path to victory? Joining me now is political columnist and host of the podcast with friends like these, Anna Marie Cox, and then staff writer at The Atlantic and MSNBC political contributor, Mark Leibovich. So I welcome you both. Anna, I know that you have said in the past that Haley is a stronger candidate than people give her credit for, and a Biden-Haley matchup would make you more nervous than a Biden-Trump matchup. However, as you can see it, the odds seem stacked against her. Do you still see a path where she moves past South Carolina and hangs on through, say, Super Tuesday, March 5th? I think we've all learned that anything can happen. True. <laughs> so I don't want to say no, but it seems unlikely. I do think that she would be just as dangerous as a vice presidential candidate as she would be as a presidential candidate. Uh, I think that she's got a lot of people fooled uh, into thinking that she's a moderate. I think also her criticism of Donald Trump make people think that she's somehow different from him in policy. And I want to remind people that just because you are right about Donald Trump doesn't make you right about everything. You know, I mean, her criticisms of him are on target, but her policies are incredibly similar to him. So she presents as someone who is a return to politics as normal, right? She talks like a politician that we recognize from the pre-Trump era. She is not a politician that we should have from the pre-Trump era. I mean, I wasn't a huge fan of the Republican Party prior to Trump, um, but she is not a return to anything. She is definitely someone who represents the post-MAGA Republican Party. Do you want to place bets real quickly on the on the prospect of her becoming the Veep nominee? Put, being put on I think ticket? that they're not zero. Again, it's so hard. I was burned so badly. <laughs> I think a lot of us were in trying to make predictions in 16. Uh, I think she she would take it if it's offered hmm. to her, and I think he will offer to her. We can't believe hmm. a word either of them say moving forward about what's going to happen. I mean, Trump will take anyone back into the fold if they suck up to him hard enough. And I think also Haley is a crass enough politician that she's not going to say no to a VP slot. I mean, she was critical of him before, and she became his ambassador to the United Nations. I mean, all, no one's taking anything off the table between the two of them. Okay. You wrote, Mark, about how Haley ramped up her attacks on Trump in the recent day, saying that it's a start, but is it too little too late, or do you see a chance for her? Mark, can you hear me? Uh, I have a narrow chance. I mean, I think it's it's certainly a long shot. Oh, sorry. Is it, can you hear me? Whoop. Am yeah, I losing? Am I, am I on? Well, all right, we're good. Sorry. Uh, unstable internet connection. Um, I think it's a long shot. There's no question about it. I think I agree with Anna Marie, which is that I, I would disregard pretty much anything she said that kind of quasi rules out um, her at some point very soon joining the fold. I mean, I think an expectation about her, despite some of her recently, you know, toughened rhetoric, is that she will, you know, kiss the ring when the time comes, and that could come pretty soon. And obviously, it's not coming soon enough for Donald Trump. But look, I mean, she has, I think, since New Hampshire, which was, you know, now five days ago, definitely sharpened her attacks. I mean, she she has gone to levels that I didn't expect her to. I sort of expected that she would kind of do a second place, you know, maybe he'll pick me to be vice president sort of strategy, uh, make the party happy, unify them, make Donald Trump happy. Uh, but she seems to be going in the other direction, which I guess I'm somewhat heartened by. But uh, I do ag agree with Anna Marie in that I, I wouldn't rule anything out as far as her coming, you know, running back into the fold when when the moment suits her. Okay, so so of these two prospects, Mark, of her kissing the ring, to use your uh, phrase there, and potentially being a Veep nominee, versus having a Chris Christie-esque sort of role for the remainder of the campaigns, even though she's, like Chris Christie, unable to continue running and campaigning for president, would she continue being a voice that calls out Donald Trump? Because Anna says she does it very well, and she has. <laughs> She does do it very well. I mean, I've been sort of surprised by how well she does it. I would certainly bet on the the more cautious route on her part. I mean, she's very expedient. Um, she's 
you know, she's not that old. I mean, she is, she's in her early fifties. I mean, she could definitely run again if she feels like, you know, she wants to uh, stay viable for 2028 or some kind of future position. That seems to be more her DNA, but look, I mean, Chris Christie, I think has run a very noble race. I mean, unfortunately his race is over and he's not really going anywhere. And I can't imagine, um, you know, we'll be hearing that much more from him. So um, it, it's kind of the, the addiction to uh, appearing relevant or appearing, you know, Know, so like a, a player in in these races that she's going to probably be choosing from, and and look, she's a politician. At the end of the day, I imagine she'll take a more political um, perspective on this. So, Anna, even if Haley isn't the nominee, how significant is it that a woman was Trump's biggest primary challenger, and that she gave him a good run for his money? I mean, literally outraising him by a few million dollars, <clears> according <throat> to her super PAC. I would love to read something into it. I would love to say that it's progress, but her actual policies are so retrogressive that it's hard for me to feel good about it. Uh, you know, she is extremely pro forced birth, as I would say it. She uh, signed some very aggressive anti choice legislation in South Carolina, and she said that she would be for a national abortion ban uh, if one came to her desk as president. Um, she is anti trans rights. Uh, she is. Uh, she tries to sort of hew this middle ground when it comes to anti-racism. That I think, if you read closely, she's really not very dedicated to it. Uh, and I also think, and I think this is something I really wanted to say, which is that you can be a victim of patriarchy, or you can be oppressed by patriarchy, and still be a bad person, and still be someone who doesn't deserve to win. And so I think that's kind of what we're seeing here with Haley. I also wanted to add that her attacks on Trump in some ways could be a really interesting bank shot for the Trump team to make if they put her on the ticket. Because who is Trump losing? Who has he lost? Who have they kind of written off? The suburban woman, right? Uh, the suburban uh, Republican woman. Uh, her having been critical of him and being able to maintain some kind of like the way that sometimes, uh, I don't know, this is a dangerous metaphor, but that a woman will kind of roll her eyes at her own husband and be like, well, you know, you have to put up with him um, because like we love him anyway, like, you know, for all of his faults, she could kind of balance Trump out in that regard and make it seem like he's learning something or that he's learned something by putting her on the ticket. And I think that's really dangerous as well. She has just, I, I want to say again, she is so good at pretending to be a normal politician uh, that I, that's why I find her such a threat. I think someone else on the ticket, someone like Vivek Ramaswamy, um, who Ted Cruz with even less charisma, I don't know, like, <laughs> I don't think that that's going to do it for the Trump ticket. Uh, I do think that he is probably going to look for a woman. And I think it's it's a play. It's it's pure and simple a play. So I'm going to ask this question of you, Mark, because I'm going to presume listening to Anna that she would have a no answer to this. But will Haley's campaign have any lasting effect on the party overall in terms of offering a different type of non-MAGA female Republican versus, say, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert? Um, potentially, it sort of depends how long she sticks around. I'm, I'm not of the belief that she's going to stick around that long um, because, you know, especially once you know, places like Nevada roll in and she doesn't seem to be making any effort there. I mean, it's going to be kind of uh, the momentum, I imagine, will will um, mount against her. But having said that, um, maybe, although it looks, I mean, Trump is such a sort of one dimensional sui generis character here. I mean, it's not like someone hanging around for the first few rounds of primaries is going to change the identity of this party right now in any meaningful way. I mean, this is a Trump party. Um, it's all about gratifying Trump in some ways. If she's willing to do that, I, I guess she might get a look as, as his VP. I think that's very unlikely because I don't think Trump is really going to be, you know, open minded and mature enough about sort of looking at someone who defied him. But look, I wouldn't rule it out. But ultimately, I don't think she's a big difference maker as far as changing or recasting the identity of the party at this stage. I mean, this is someone who has run a pretty you know, savvy campaign, a pretty cautious campaign, mm -hmm. uh, has outlasted a whole other you know, bunch of people in a very mediocre field. And I mean, I guess that could be good enough to keep her around for the next few years. But I don't see it as any big um, you know, defining factor in, in who the party is or what the party is at this point. I want to ask you, uh, lastly, Anna, uh, about the E. Jean Carroll verdict, because I know that you are a survivor of sexual assault. You have written E. Jean Carroll's victory over Trump is every survivor's victory. Tell us a bit more about your reaction to this ruling and the impact it could have on voters. 
You know, first of all, I want to say that this is something I think a lot of people did a good job of remembering when Trump first ran, which is that he is a walking, talking trigger for a lot of people who are survivors, right? And so I just want to put that up front for people that if you are a survivor, RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network.org, RAIN.org, is a great place to go for tools in your recovery. And then I want to say I represent half of American women, and I think it's a third of men in being a survivor of some form of sexual violence. And I think what really hit me about the E. Jean Carroll verdict is that I remember when she first wrote about this, and she refused to call it rape. And she also talked a lot about how it wasn't that bad, right? And she said, other people have it worse. And I think that is something that a lot of people who are survivors tell themselves. It wasn't that bad and other people had it worse. And I think that keeps us from, it's not just I want the sort of hackneyed idea of claiming your own story. I think it keeps us from healing. I think it keeps us from claiming solidarity. And I think it also, in my case, seeing this verdict, I belittle my own story all the time when I say that, when I say it wasn't that bad. And here we have a case where the president is have a claim of $83 million for belittling her story, right? For talking down her story, for making fun of her for her story, for saying things like she's not not my type. And for me, it's just a reminder that I shouldn't belittle my own story, right? That my story counts as much as anyone else's that's a survivor. And that if I wouldn't want someone to talk down E. Jean Carroll's narrative, if I wouldn't want someone to discount her, then I need to discount, not discount my own. Okay. Well, I admire you for that candor. I admire you as well, Mark, as always. Uh, I'm glad to have you both. I look forward to having you both on the broadcast again soon. Thank you.